Well, good evening. Welcome to the worship of the living God. Our preparation for worship this evening comes to us from George Mueller. Mueller was, a, I want to say, German immigrant to England in the 19th century. Wound up, I don't know if it was 13 or 14 orphanages that he started running by himself. Uh, remember when there was chimney sweeps in, in England and all of that? He was one of the people who started to find homes for all these boys. And his biography, it's fascinating. But this is what he had to say. My business, with all my might, is to serve my own generation. In doing so, I shall best serve the next generation, should the Lord Jesus tarry. The longer I live, the more I'm enabled to realize that I have but one life to live on earth, and that this one life is only a brief life for sowing in comparison with eternity for reaping. We're going to be thinking about this evening, thinking that the exiles going to exile in Babylon, and what did God tell the people to do with this time that they saw as incredibly unwelcome? Pretty much what George Mueller said the business of, of his life was. Business of our lives as well. The call to worship is from Peter. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We're going to think about that in terms of God's providential dealings, of accepting, okay, God, this is, this is what's going on in my life. How do I humble myself under your hand in this? But that's part of worship as well. You humble yourself under God. That's part of worship. God is you're, you're up here. I'm, I'm down here. Let's go to our God in silent prayer asking that that would be our experience of worship. Father, we are often quite scared to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We buck against it. We fight against it. And Father, we ask that we might be those who do humble, yourself, uh, humble ourselves under your hand, that in due time you would lift us up. And Father, we ask that that would be the case for us in this sanctuary and worshiping using live stream this evening. And Father, we would be humbling ourselves before you. As Father, we desperately do long to be, be lifted up. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first hymn we're going to be singing this evening, it's from, it's one of the ones about creation. Once in a while we start with a creation hymn to, to exalt God in the beginning. Two verses of Let All Things Now Living.
This great God who we praise is the one who greets you with these words. May grace be yours. May God's mercy be yours. May his peace rest upon you. And these come from the God who is and the God who was and the God who is to come. And all of God's people said, Amen. And as God's greeted us, let's greet one another. teasing Dolan on vacation. We could see Canada, but we couldn't get there. But Dolan, maybe it's a live stream. Maybe I shouldn't mention that you're an international traveler right now. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, a confession of faith, we're going to be looking at question and answer 88, 89, and 90. We're going to be thinking about the, the exiles and their deep desire to kind of live in false dreams and kind of hoping other things would happen rather than actually getting down to do what God wants them to do. What is involved in genuine repentance or conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the rising to life of the new. What is the dying away of the old self? To be genuinely sorry for sin and more and more to hate and run away from it. What is the rising to life of the new self? wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. I'm going to be thinking about that, especially every kind of good work this evening. Out of the depths I cry, thinking about the exiles. We're going to sing this together. I'm not sure the last time we've sang it, but we will, we will see how familiar it is. worked well. Thank you, Jane. Let's take a seat. Going to God with our petitions and prayers. What can, what can we lift before our Father? Randy.
kind of reach out to them and offer as much help as possible with their uh, uh, situation that they're in with their home and everything. And, and I'm guessing they need help with moving stuff and whatever. You know. yeah. Randy's. Um Thinking about Lee and, and Judy, this happened with his diagnosis in the midst of them moving. So, I mean, Lee's been incredible. They've both been really, really busy. But thinking about um, moving everything over, I can't, the town escapes me. Wet, Wentworth, is that? I'm sorry. Okay, Wentworth. So, I mean, an hour, 15 minutes, they're moving everything out of there. I think August 15, I, I believe, is the move-in date. And Randy mentioning that as a congregation, it would be wise to be checking in with Lee and with Judy to see how it is that we can support them. I, when I talk, visited Lee in the hospital yesterday, I had brought that, brought that up. Um, and he had mentioned thinking there being blank of spores, many, many blank of spores of, of help, but I think you're spot on of different ways to get in touch with Judy to see what we can do. Because I also know for Judy, I, I, I don't want to speak for her, but checking, considering her recent foot surgery as well, so you got that piled on top. Driving is not the easiest for her, so somebody driving and being with her would be much appreciated as well, and sitting there with her. And with COVID regulations, it's only two people at a time in there right now. So what that, that kind of means is if you go, they'll let you know how many people that there are up there. That, that's kind of how, how that works. But I think that that's a wise, it's a wise statement, see how we can best care for them. We got to pack up stuff in their house this this week. I think that makes sense. I think probably a good way to go is I'll talk to Lee and Judy's household of faith elder and deacon after this, and we'll kind of check in to see if there's any mass way we can help them out. It's a good word, brother. Continue praying for rain, indeed. Got three underlines on that one for the rain. Indeed, safety on vacation. Yeah, things can change quick with those things. So. Pray for my dad. It's his 69th birthday today. And that just kind of, it just kind of happens like that. Um, so... thinking Europe floods and then the fires here in the U.S. Darren. Yeah. I saw one of the, I saw a van that said, said living for Jesus on the, on the way up to Sioux Falls and I figured we were kind of meeting, meeting part way the other day but it sounds like it went really well. Was that Palisades? Is my understanding, right? Glenn. <coughs> Indeed. Praying for the country, thinking about political political unrest. Makes you kind of long for much more boring days. Huh? Nathan. Indeed. 
thinking about Sunday school teachers coming, coming up, praying for the Lord, we're working within people's hearts. Incredibly important task. Getting my steps in here. Oh, indeed. Um, probably just hold off on the name since it's left. Um, Bethany's got a, a cousin who is involved in a life of addiction and wound up and has accepted going into rehab this last week. So I'll be praying for, for the Lord's help with, with that. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Father, as we have been learning to, to pray with uh, the morning text, Father, we now we, we practice what we preach, we practice what we hear. We've come before you knowing how utterly dependent we are on you. We think about the, the situation with rain. We can't, we can't make rain. Can't make, make it go the way we want it to go, which is why we turn to, to you, asking for rain and a good time. We thank you for the gentle rains that we've received. Father, we do ask for more. Think about the responsibilities that, that that entails of thinking about having fields and crops and Father we present this before you because this certainly concerns us and you are concerned about what concerns us we sometimes find that hard to to, to believe because any number of areas if you were as concerned as we're concerned you would do what we want you to to do, but Father, there we recognize that you know more and that you've got any number of purposes you're working out. Part of those purposes is to call us to pray for what we need. And so we do pray for, for rain, knowing that you know what we need, but Father, knowing that you also enjoy it when we come before you asking for what we need. We think as well about floods in, in Europe and fires in the, the United States. And we've got no idea how to run the, the world. We, we tend to think we, we do in any number of areas, but, Father, we know that you, you do. We don't know your reasons for this. Father, we ask that you would alleviate the, the suffering in these circumstances. We pray that your people, especially as we think about in, in Europe, in which your people are a, a very small, often beleaguered minority of a, of a minority, Father, that people might recognize that your people are there to, to do good to those in, in need. Pray for our nation. We think about the political unrest. Goodness, as we think about any number of news stories over the past couple of years, things that are much, much different than a lot of us have ever experienced. We go to you knowing that you are the, the king that you yourself are our political leader. That you are the king to whom we owe all, and you're the one who does govern over all. It's hard for us to, to understand how that all works, but that's not really our concern. 
just like little children don't need to know all the different things that their parents are doing to, to govern and supply for the, the home. No, we don't need to know all of that, but Father, we do know that this is not as it ought to be, and so we pray for it to be more as we ought to be. As we think about people we, we love out and about and think about friends and think about church members, pray for safety on their, their travels, a season in which many go out for, for refreshment and for vacation. And Father, these times of, of joy are to, to be refreshing, but we ask for safety. And Father, thinking about those we love as well, I pray for my Father. I thank you for him. Thank you for any number of provisions to me and my family through him, and I ask that you would bless him on his, his birthday. I think about ways that my dad has, has taught me and what he's taught me. We think about the, the cadets, this ministry devoted to helping boys and grow more and more into men after your own heart. Thank you that the camp out went well. We thank you that there was, Father, that there was that there's men that take an interest in the life of boys. It's, it seems so obvious as we read your word that this is the way it ought to be, but we look around our culture and we say that is not always the way it goes in the, the world. But Father, this ministry represents something that is certainly dear to your heart, and so we thank you for it. We thank you for this camp out. And as well, we pray for thinking Sunday school teachers. We ask that you'd be putting upon people's minds and hearts to Think about you know, reading about George Mueller impacting people for eternity. That's a lot of what Sunday school is and does. I can think of different friends I've got who can remember decades and decades later Sunday school teachers that might have thought that what they were teaching was falling on deaf ears, but that's not the case. Planting seeds and bearing fruit in a harvest to a, to a hundredfold. And Father, we ask that in the life of Bethany's relative that the harvest, that there might be a harvest that of seed, of, of truth that's been sown as we think about him in rehab. And Father, we ask that it would go well. We think about the time in which we, we live and access to any number of, of addictive substances and troubles and sorrows this causes. We ask that this might not be the case anymore. And Father, as we think about sorrows, difficulties, and trials, we think about Lee and Judy. We ask that you would heal Lee. We think about the chemo. He's already, it's already underway. We ask that we as your people might offer as much help as we, we can. Lee and Judy are in the middle of a number of, of transitions, which is, is hard. And a lot of us know these transitions. Of, of moving, of just a lot of changes and how difficult that is. And Father, this is now all on top, top of it, piled together. You know this, but we come before you because we care for them. If there's ways that we can be of help, we ask that we would be. And Father, as we go forward in this week, we ask that we might be able to, to be busy about what you would have us be doing, that you'd be keeping keeping any number of, of distractions from the world, our own flesh and the, the devil uh, that keep to pull us off track for what would be profitable and beneficial for, for others and also glad and joyful and content resting in your will for us, that you'd be working against that so we might be offering ourselves as servants to you, whether young or old. And Father, we ask this in, in Jesus' name, amen. going to, to stand together, singing and preparing our hearts. Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
Please open your Bibles with me to Jeremiah 29. We're in 29 this week and next week. We're in 30, I think, for a couple weeks. I know we're in 40 for a week and 50 for a week. It's going to start picking up speed until we head to our next series. But Jeremiah 29 is one of the most crucial points in Jeremiah. This series is largely kind of like the, the highlights of Jeremiah. If you go to Yellowstone and can only see, say, 10 things, what do you see? If you're in Jeremiah, you can only see certain aspects. What do you choose to highlight? That's what we're doing here. Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 9. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent for Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. We'll pick up the, the next next week. Let's pray to God. Father, we do ask that you would now speak to us, just as we said. Speak to us that we might speak. And Father, that we might see your Son. It's, in, it's him that we need to see, need to hear from. We ask this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Bethany had uh, mentioned the uh, extended family member that we had prayed, prayed for. The, the introduction isn't about about him, it's a different addicting substance, it's a different life story, but what she brought that up, it got me thinking about addictions and often what they wind up doing. Um, studies show that 6% of Americans over the age of 12 have tried meth. Meth's incredibly addictive. I want you to imagine a woman who's, who's addicted to it. Imagine she was a, a lawyer. Not a lawyer anymore, um, because as often happens when people are, are hooked on meth, they, they steal, they do all sorts of foolish things to, to get money to get more meth. This lady in this illustration sold confidential legal information. Again, this is just something that, that I made up. But I think, I'm, certain, I'm sure there is a life story like that somewhere. She loses her, her studio apartment. Meth will take all sorts of, take everything from you. Largely against her will, she winds up in, in rehab, and she's difficult in group meetings. She keeps talking about the different high-profile cases that she, she used to try. She keeps mentioning, you know, I was one of the top 40 women under, under 40, the paper said. She keeps bringing this up in group processing. She talked about the ivory bathroom vanity that she, she had and that she lost. Keeps saying that, I can't wait to get out of this place to get back to my real life. Thinking that the real life is going back to being a lawyer, but that's, that's gone. She, she's been disbarred. Thinking that she's going back to her studio apartment, but that's not the case either. It's easier for this woman to, to live in in illusions, live with false dreams than to actually face up to reality. Now, that's just not true for this woman. That's, that's true for, for all of us in different ways. False dreams are very, very attractive. We find it easier to imagine what could have been. 
rather than to work on what is. And that, that's true for Babylon, the, the exiles in Babylon. They're living by false dreams. They're thinking, we're going home soon. They're refusing to put down roots. They're refusing to live their lives because they think any day now it's, it's all going to get better. What they needed is the, the stiff wisdom as that woman in treatment needed, which is weep deeply over the life that you hoped would be. Grieve the losses, feel the pain, then wash your face, trust God, and embrace the life that he's given you. That's John Piper's wisdom, thinking about facing up to reality. Weep deeply over the life that you, you wanted. Grieve the losses and feel the pain, and then you wash your face and you trust God, and you embrace the life that he's given you. That a woman in in rehab in this illustration, she's still, she's still alive. She needs to realize it's God's will she's still alive. And okay, well now this is where I'm at. I need to embrace this life and obey God here. And the same is true for the exiles. We're, we're still alive. God's still speaking to us. There, there's still hope for us, but we've got to embrace this and move forward rather than spending our time thinking about what what was or what could have been. And that's the claim of the sermon is you embrace the life God's given you. You think that'd be really easy because it's the life you got, but what else do you embrace? But it's it's very difficult. We're going to see this in two points. First, sending a letter. And second, bloom where you're planted. We see Jeremiah send a letter in verses 1 to 3. We see a call to Israel to bloom where they're planted in verses 4 through 9. First is sending a letter. Our text for this this evening, what it is, it's the the contents of a letter that will be the text for next week as well. You see this in verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests the prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The letter starts by listing, here's the different groups that that I'm writing to. And the first is the surviving exiles. And now when you hear surviving exile, what does that clearly imply, the surviving elders? That not all the elders survived. They didn't all survive this trip to Babylon. Some of them died along the way, some of these leaders in the community maybe got killed by soldiers, maybe just happened to die, who knows? But Jeremiah is saying, I know not all of you lived. And, okay, if you got your bulletin, just turn to the back. You look at council, you look at pastor, elders, deacons. What he's writing to is saying, okay, among all these men, those of you who actually survived and are now still alive in Babylon, I mean, that, that, that makes it real because you know these men. The people knew these men too. These are men who once were sons, their fathers, many of them grandfathers. The letter's written as well to priests, to prophets. Jeremiah wants this letter taught. Nathan had brought up Sunday school teachers praying for, for that. Jeremiah's saying, okay, this letter needs to, to be taught. It's a word of God for, for this circumstance in which you find yourself. And in that, it's, it's very similar to the New Testament letters. That they're all occasional in one way or another, meaning they're written for such a time as this, to use a line from Esther. They're written because there's, current, there's difficulties and there, there's circumstances that are hard, and, well, God, what do we do? And that's why these letters are, are written. We've got to learn how do you read these letters rightly. We, we did that with adult ed this past year. That was one of our studies. We looked at different genres of scripture because you can't read them all the same. You can't read law and, and letters the same because law is don't, do not murder. All right, that, that's, that's something that you can say, okay, you, you, you'd never murder. But verse 5, build houses. God's not saying, you know, if you live in an apartment, what are you doing? Make sure you build a house. You've got to say, what did it mean for these people in this circumstance, and then how do you apply it? Meaning, to know what it means for us in northwest Iowa, we've got to figure out what did it mean for these exiles. 
the letter sent by royal post. You see this in verse 3. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. It seems that what these two men are on is they're on a mission from Zedekiah to Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah was the king that the Nebuchadnezzar installed. Okay, now I'm telling you what to do. I'm in charge. You're just carrying out my orders. Zedekiah is probably sending him a report through these two men of saying, here's how everything's going. Elisa was uh, a part of a, a scribal family. Two of his brothers were in the, the previous king's administration. One of his, his relatives would actually protect Jeremiah in a passage we didn't study. Jeremiah and his family seem like they've got some, some connections. This might be why Elisa was willing to carry this letter. And the letter is pretty critical of the king, of Zedekiah, we'll see. But it could also be to the point that Zedekiah is so utterly powerless that people don't really care what he says anyway. And so Jeremiah, he sends this letter. And he sends it as the Lord's ambassador. So Elica, sorry, Elisa is Zedekiah's ambassador. He says exactly what Zedekiah once said to Nebuchadnezzar. How are all these different, report, how are all these different directives of mine going in Judea? Ella says, well, this is, this is what we're doing. This is what Zedekiah told me to say. And that's exactly what Jeremiah does with the Lord. He's the Lord's ambassador. This is what the Lord told me to say. The New Testament letters work the same way. That, that's what Paul says about himself. I'm just Jesus' ambassador to the church in Galatia. He says, Paul, an apostle, set not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, I, I'm not writing this to you because I've got a lot of thoughts about well, how you should live. I'm writing this because this is what Jesus says. This is why red letter Bibles, maybe you're familiar with those where the words of Jesus are in red letters. These aren't bad, but they're misleading in the sense of, okay, well, the red letters are here and the rest of the Bible is kind of here. No, well, what Paul is saying is, so when you read this letter, this is as if Jesus is saying this to you. That's what Paul's saying. And what Jeremiah's saying is when you get this letter, this is as if God's writing this letter to you. That's, that's why we study this letter. It's not because Jeremiah had some thoughts about how people should live in a new community thousands of years ago. It's because God himself had some thoughts about how people should live. And it applies to us today. This is why you study any part of Scripture. And this is why you study, as we're going to see in our next evening series, that's why you study all of Scripture and that's our first point. Second point is the longer one, which is bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted, this is what commentator Jack London calls the, this, this whole letter to the exiles. And it makes sense that this is really what comes first because you put first things first. And the letter begins by making it clear that it was the Lord who sent the exiles away. Verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those who I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What the Lord wants the people to know is it's not just because Jehoiah Kim made such foolish political decisions and Jehoiah Chin made such horrible political decisions that you're in this situation. He wants to say, I sent you into exile. Yeah, they made a lot of foolish decisions. Who do you think was behind all of this? He's saying, you're not there just because of bad luck. You might think to yourself, man, I, I wish those were my grandparents' generation. They didn't need to deal with this exile. God says, well, you know, I got you exactly where I want you. I'm the one who's in charge of your life. You're where I want you to be. I sent you here. The, the, the original claim I had for the sermon was humble yourself under the hand of the Lord. The Lord, providentially, he is in charge of the various aspects of your life. You humble yourself under them. That's how you embrace the life that God gives you. Now, as we've seen in these exiles, they thought they were going home. So they had prophets after prophets in Babylon telling them, you know, it's just going to be a little while. Oh, you're you're going to see, you're going to see God do some amazing stuff. And the Lord doesn't want them to have those illusions. That's verse 5. Build houses and settle down. Bethany and I, we've been watching the show Alone. Was that, well, it's on Netflix, but is that originally History Station? I like all these TV stations. They start off really about something, and then they just throw it out the window. Like, but what Alone is, anybody ever watch Alone? 
No, but we're the only people that watch alone. Or there's a lot of people secretly wanting to hear about alone. What the idea of the show is, is you take 10 wilderness experts and you put them in an incredibly harsh climate. They can take 10 different, different items that help them survive. They're, they're miles apart from each other. The two that we watched were in the Arctic. And they, the last person who, who makes it, who survives, wins. They, they win the $500,000. Or if you make it 100 days in the last one you watched, you get a million dollars. And you get med checks from time to time. They can pull you out if you're malnourished. You get a satellite phone that's on you at all times in case you get injured. The ones we watched were, again, in the Arctic. Um, September 18 is when they dropped the people off in the last one. Joel Lusing's a little too excited about this, probably thinking about giving it a shot. Um, what do you think the first thing that they did in the Arctic setting down in July is, setting down in September is? They built shelters. They built themselves houses. Why? Because they're planning on staying there for a long time. They want to be there as long as they can. You're going to be there for a while. And that, that's what Jeremiah is saying to the people. You build houses because you're going to be here for a long time. You, you're not taking off anytime soon. You, you make this your home. And the exiles had hoped that what the Lord was going to do is he was going to overthrow Babylon and that they were going to go home to Judea. There was rumblings with the empire, difficulties in the empire at that time, so it's not totally far-fetched. And this letter says the Lord doesn't have any such plans. The Lord's plans did not necessitate Babylon falling. So the people needed to settle down live those lives that they had. And the same is true with the New Testament. When Jesus comes, everybody thinks that the Lord's plans are going to require, require getting rid of Rome. You're coming as a king, you've got to get rid of Rome. The Lord's plans don't require that. A lot of the New Testament letters, and especially Revelation, it says, bloom where you're planted in the Roman Empire. And the exile's there to, to make a life in Babylon. The effort that they put in is it's a reversal of them going into the promised land. If you remember our study in Deuteronomy in the promised land, what God says to you is you're going to go into the promised land. There's going to be fields that you've never cultivated, but you're going to harvest them. You didn't plant, but you're going to get the produce of them. There's going to be houses you're going to move into that the Canaanites had. You didn't build these things, but you're just moving in. It's already prepared for you. I got it all ready for you. In the exile, he says, okay, here you build your own houses. You plant your own fields. You, you didn't like you, what you weren't willing to keep the, the commands that I had when I gave you everything. You're, you're still alive, but you're going to see how it is now when you've got to provide for yourself in certain ways. But he says, I, I want you to flourish. You see this in verse 6. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and daughters and give them in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number. Don't decrease. He's not saying, okay, we'll intermarry with the, the Babylonians who worship these other gods. He's saying, increase just like you did when you were in Egypt. Increase just like God told you at the beginning. This is be fruitful and multiply. God's saying, I haven't given up on you. All right, this, this is like, it's, similar, it's, it's very similar to say you, you get pulled out of the game and your coach communicates to you that he hasn't given up on you. You're heading back into the game. That, that's what he's saying here. I, I'm not done with you. And the exiles are not simply to settle down. They're, they're to be productive citizens. Verse 7, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Now this would be crazy difficult. Because how, how do you try to make Babylon better? How do you try to say, I'm going to do whatever I can for, for these people's good? Because these people are the ones that ripped you from your house, separated you from your extended family, and maybe even your own family, and now God's saying to you, okay, you seek these people's good. And these are the people that are mocking you. That, that's, I think, Psalm 137, the way it begins. Essentially, it's just saying we were mocked all the time. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the trees, we hung up our harps because our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Essentially, what's going on here is the Babylonians are, Babylonians are saying, you know, we kind of need some music here for this party. Let's bring out the Jews. 
How about how great is our God? Can you sing how great is our God for us? We think that's a really slick number. Sing it out for us. Because your God's so great that you're here as our servants. That's what that psalm's about. They're mocking the living daylights out of God's people. How great is your God? Well, what are you doing here then? What are you doing as our slaves? You can understand why these exiles would want to go home. You can understand why these exiles would want Babylon to fall. You can understand why they would think God would want Babylon to fall. And the Lord says, okay, you make your home here, and you seek to be productive citizens there. Rather than kind of retreating into your Jewish ghettos, you're to be actually in Babylon. You're to, to seek to do a good where you can. The same is true for us, right? We're not to retreat ourselves. We're not to pretend we can be out of the world. You're in the world. How do you do it? Do it good. Daniel's the best picture of this. So the Babylonians, Jeremiah is saying, is that they should find you a beneficial people. They might not like you. They might make fun of you. But they should say, you know what? We actually are better off with these with these Jews. And Jesus, he's saying the same thing about the church in the Sermon on the Mount. You're you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. He's saying this this should be better off because you're here. That's what it's it's about. And it's the sticky sticky walk that we, this difficult balance we all know is, okay, how do I be in the world but not of the world? You got that figured out? You let me know. Because I might fall off this side. You might fall off that side. It's just hard. But that's, that's the call. And part of it is thinking, okay, exactly what we had last week with Mission Sunday, uh, it was encouraging for me as saying, you know what, I think the world is a, is a slightly better place because I'm, I'm in it. Not that I'm that great shakes. But man, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this. I want to be helping that. They want to be helping that. that, that that's, that's this picture that, that Jeremiah has given. Those people that were standing up there and us figuring out how we can help them. And you've got your own things you're hopefully doing. And the exiles are to, to pray for Babylon. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you prosper. And the language here, it makes clear there's different words for God. There's Elohim and this is kind of the God of the whole world. And of course, they're all the same God, the Lord. But there's also Yahweh, the, the covenantal name of God. And Jeremiah uses this name very distinctly as if to say, okay, the God of the land that the Babylonians are going to completely decimate, the God of the people who the Babylonians are going to largely kill, you pray to that God for the Babylonians. In other words, you pray for your enemies. God's not giving in any, any victim mentality here. Say so you, you pray for these people. There's other passages, and we're going to study one in Jeremiah, that says he, the Lord, he, where he says, this is what I'm going to do with Babylon. And the Lord takes incredible vengeance on Babylon. But it's the Lord who does it. He says to the people, you seek its welfare. You pray for its good. And notice that praying for your enemies, it leaves them in the category of enemies. This is where we tend to get mixed up. We tend to think that praying for enemies means you move them to the category of friends. No, when you pray for your enemies, you're praying for your enemies because they're your enemies. They're still your enemies when they pray. Babylon wasn't simply buddy-buddy with God's people because they prayed for them. This is Paul. If your enemy's hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you're going to heap burning coals on our heads. This doesn't mean that your enemy is really your friend, but there's just been some misunderstandings. It says they're your enemy, but then it asks, whose enemy were you? You were God's enemy. And when when you and God were enemies, what did God do? Well, when you were still enemies, Jesus died for you. You settle down. You seek good in these new homeland with these people. You, you do good to these people. You pray for them. 
Now, that's what it would mean to embrace the life God gave these people, but it's a lot easier to live by lies. Verse 8, don't listen to the prophets and the diviners among you who deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They're prophesying lies in your names. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. So the prophets, the diviners, they're telling God's people, again, you're, you're, go, you're going home soon. With Hannah and I, a couple weeks back, we, we referenced that two years and the yoke of Babylon will be broken. Don't worry about this. So what these false prophets are saying and what the people are pressuring these false prophets to say is it's really all going to be good. You don't need to figure out how you're going to actually make it work in Babylon. You don't need to figure out how you're going to deal with these people that you really don't need to deal with. It's going to be over before you know it. So don't worry about any of that stuff. That's what they're saying. Never underestimate how the power of living in fantasy land. I remember the illustration in the intro of the woman on meth. I can think about myself. That fantasy land's very, very powerful because I don't really need to do anything. I don't need to change anything. I can blame other people. And this is why I'm not doing what I would like to do. And this is why my life isn't going the way I would like it to go. If only this would have gone my way. If something would go my way, things would, that would be amazing. I mean, false dreams, they're, they're a whole lot more popular than reality. Funyuns, anybody here ever have Funyuns? Taking a, a clear detour here. Funyuns, they're, they're kind of like, um, they're like little onion rings, only they're chips. Nobody here's ever had Funyuns. Thank you, Gracia. Now, now Gracia's known as the one who has Funyuns. So, thank you. Six gold stars for Gracia. I get 14, all right, because you, you, you helped me in that one. There was years and years ago a satire magazine thinking about Funyuns, these chips, and the, the article was entitled, Funyuns Still Outselling responsibility Ins." So Funyuns Still Outselling responsibility Ins." This is from that, that satire article. I just don't understand what went wrong, said James Connell, CEO of Delayed Gratification Foods, the Dallas maker of responsibility ins. Everybody knows that responsibility and self-reliance are virtues which, with patience and persistence, bring rewards far greater than the fleeting pleasures of instant gratification. And frankly, that's what our competitor has to offer. We felt sure that customers would respond to our product's image of hard work and long-term stability. And yet Funyuns still, still outsell by a good percentage responsibility. And the, the joke there, of course, is fun's always way more popular than responsibility. Blowing off things you're supposed to do is way more popular than actually doing what you're supposed to do. Figuring out how to avoid... We, we tend to put a whole lot more mental energy in figuring out how to avoid what ought to be done than doing what ought to be done. That, that, that's what that, that the joke is there. That's true for the exiles. I mean, false dreams outsell reality. They just do. I mean, it, it's, why do you think in so many ways the world's the way it is? False dreams, that that's what gets in the way of these exiles blooming what's planted. Jeremiah is saying, don't listen to these people who think it's all just going to go away soon because then you're actually not going to live your life. Or as Eugene Peterson takes it on this passage, he puts it, false dreams get in the way of honest living. That's true for the exiles. That's true for, for that young woman in rehab. That, that's true for us. The last place we tend to want to obey is the situation in which we actually are placed. We, we'd rather dream, and we'd rather tell, have other people tell us false dreams. And the way forward, what it requires is it requires somebody bursting our bubble. That's what Jeremiah does. Weep deeply over the life that you hoped would be. As Piper put it, grieve the losses, feel the pain, and then you wash your face, you trust God, and you embrace the life that he's given you. Amen. Father, we ask that we might do that. Help us. To, to do that. We can't obey for the, the exiles. 
You don't want us to. We can't obey for anybody other than ourselves, but help us to do so. Help us to obey. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thinking about what the Lord was up to with the exile, it's very mysterious. We're going to be singing God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Five verses. Go to our God in prayer for justice for all. And Father, as we heard about seeking the, the peace of the, the city, the prosperity of the city in which you've placed us, justice for all is right in line. Father, I thank you for your providential arrangement between the, the deacons and, and myself. I'm not talking to each other at all about this, but it also not just happening to wind up this way. We please work through this ministry. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. After God's parting blessing, we'll sing, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he be gracious unto you. May the Lord smile on you. May he give you peace. Amen. Amen.